Can we call the meeting to order, please? Thank you. I'd like to call the meeting of the affordable housing program to order. What we do the pardon? Roll call. Okay. All right. So we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk, for that direction. Madam Clerk, will you call the uh, roll call, please? Thank you, President Lewis Jordan. Present. Director Scott Black. Here. Director Valerie Craig. Present. Director Sharon Davis. Director Olivia Diaz. Here. Director Michael Disman. Here. Director Fred Heron. Director William McCurdy. Director Tick Seabloom, Director Dan Shaw, Director Luciana Turner. Here. A quorum is present and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is public comment. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, come to the podium and give your name for the record. The amount of discussion as well as the amount of time any single speakers allowed may be limited. Public comment that is repetitious, slanderous, offensive, and inflammatory amounts to personal attacks or in infers with the rights of other speakers is not allowed. Any person who acts in violation of these rules will be excused for the remainder of the meeting. Are there any public comments? Hearing none. Approval of min minutes. Approval of the minutes for the regular board meeting uh, minutes on June 16th, 2022. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Move to approve the minutes. It's been a, a motion by or Director Sigur Bloom and seconded by Commissioner Craig. Director Craig, excuse me. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Very good. The minutes for June 16th have been approved. The next item for possible discussion, um, public hearing may be declared open by the chairperson as required for any, any items on the, this agenda designated or discussions as possible action. Public comment that is repetitious, slanderous, offensive, inflammatory, amounts to personal attacks or infers with the rights of the, of the uh, interferes with the rights of other speakers is not allowed. Any person who acts in violation of these rules will be excused for the remainder of the meeting. Again, no discussion, any discussion on the public comment piece. And then finally, under citizen participation, item raised under this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated or acted upon by the board of directors of AHP until the notice provisions of the open meeting law have been compiled with, complied with, excuse me. If you wish to speak on matters on or off the agenda, please step up to the podium and clearly state your name and address in consideration of others and to avoid repetition and limit your comments to no more than three minutes to ensure persons equal opportunity to speak. Each subject matter will be limited to 12 minutes as a, as a courtesy. We would also like to, uh, for you not to be speaking uh, and to be seated and not interrupt the speaker or the director. Any, again, citizen participation? Good morning. My name is Venetia Kelly, landlord for 3788 Noreen Passway. My tenant has some issues with her caseworker letting her kind of being rude to her not really discussing the pr 
parameters of what she has going on or looking into her file exactly. So her rent went from 254 to almost $1,000. Ma'am, this, this is pertaining to the Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. We can either one or two things. Okay, I'm sorry, thank you. So your comments are pertaining to items pertaining to the Housing Authority. This is another meeting. This it, is okay. Yeah, so but we'll if you, we'll gladly we'll wait till the ne next meeting. Sure. And we'll have someone speak to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All you right. mean the next meeting of yeah, the next right. month? Yeah, right. It's going to no, oh, follow right after this. Yep. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you for, and thank you for the clarification. Beatrice Turner, um, I asked for affordable housing. Yes. You know, Ruin Earl is in affordable housing, Yeah, mobile home park. Mm -hmm. And you know, when Shannon was over Ruin Earl, or what, affordable, you know, that place was kept up very nice. You ought to see it now. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, they got those pine needles all on top of the roofs and, it's just, it looks a mess over there. And I know Ruin Earl turning over in his grave knowing something named after him ain't being kept up no better than that because I know Harry turning over in his grave about the airport. So, but y'all really need to go out there and look at Ruin Earl. You really do because I, I don't know who you got out there for a manager. Well, they're not concerned about it. Is there any more public comment? Yes, I have a public comment. Sweetie, this isn't, the, this isn't the right time for you. Well, when? The, there'll be another meeting after this. It's going to be your turn. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Is there a um, motion to adjourn the AHP meeting? Motion to adjourn the AHP meeting. Second. All right. Thank you. Do we need to vote? So, yeah, we're adjourned. Okay, so the AHP meeting is adjourned. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I now call this regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority on this Thursday, July 21st, 2022 to order. Uh, Madam Secretary, if you may please call the roll. Chairperson Olivia Diaz. Here. Vice Chairperson William McCurdy. Present. Commissioner Scott Black. Here. Commissioner Valerie Craig. Present. Commissioner Sharon Davis. Commissioner Michael Disman. Here. Commissioner Tick Siegerbloom. Here. Commissioner Dan Shaw. Commissioner Luciana Turner. A quorum is present and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Okay, thank you, Ms. Reese. And uh, thank you everyone for being here today, regardless of uh, triple digit heat here in the summer of Vegas. Um, I just wanna make clear for the folks who don't normally come to our meetings that we have two public comment periods. The first public comment period is to speak about things that we will address in this agenda if what you're coming here to share with us is not under any of these agendized meeting um, items, then you have to wait for the second citizen participation. So just wanna make sure that you knew which period of participation to come, much like the first meeting, there's one to talk about agenda items at the very beginning, and then there's one at the very end of the meeting. So just wanted to make that clear. Uh, so I will open public comment up for any agendized um, meetings or items on this agenda for possible discussion and action. If you wish to be heard, come to the speaker's podium, clearly state your name and address, and please spell your last name for the record. And we can limit any time, any single speaker is allowed, up to three minutes. So um, is there anyone wishing to come and speak on any of these agendized items at this time? Um, if This would be the time to speak on anything that's on this agenda that for discussion or action. Can you take one, please? Um, 
Beatrice Turner, T-U-R-N-E-R. I'm on the agenda, y'all gonna be discussing Marble Manor. And I wanna know how y'all gonna tear down Marble Manor and when Sherman Garden and Villa Capri is in worse or worse conditions, the Marble Manor look way better than um, Sherman Garden and Villa Capri. <coughs> so, y'all need to look at that first so y'all go talk about tearing down Marble Manor. And then, what, if y'all do tear down, where y'all gonna move the people to? Where they gonna move to? You ain't got nowhere to move them now. And don't try to give them no Section 8, because once they Section 8, it, it's up. They ain't gonna be ain't gonna be able to find nowhere to stay. So then they gonna be homeless. So y'all really need to look into that before y'all go talk about tearing down Marble Manor. Thank you, Ms. Turner. Anybody else wishing to speak to agendized items? Seeing none, we're gonna close this first public comment period and move on to agenda item number three, approval of minutes of the regular meeting held on June 16, 2022. Do I have any motions? Move to approve the minutes. Or any additions or deletions that any commissioners which, um, wish to bring forward? Noting no changes, I'll take Commissioner Sagerbloom's uh, first motion. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We'll move on to agenda, agenda item four, approval of agenda with the inclusion of any emergency <laughs> items and deletion of any items. So is there any emergency items, Mr. Jordan, that you are aware of need to come forth at this point? No, there are not. Okay. With that. Move to approve the agenda. I have a first by Commissioner Sagerbloom to approve the agenda as posted, seconded by Commissioner McCurdy. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on now to approve our consent agenda, which is uh, agenda item number five. Um, approval of request to write off outstanding tenant accounts receivable, vacated accounts for the period ending May 31st, 2022. Is there any discussion on this consent agenda item before proceeding with the motion to approve the consent agenda before us, board? Okay, I have a motion to approve the consent agenda by Commissioner Dismond. A second by Commissioner McCurdy. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that concludes our consent agenda items. And we're gonna move along to agenda item number six to acknowledge our departed. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we'd like to acknowledge the following uh, tenants and participants in our voucher program who, um, who passed away since our last meeting. Uh, we have Robert Ramser, Robert Hammond, James White, Vladimir Hartutin, Milone Case, Rita Cortez, Mar Cortez Martinez, Larry Strickland, Cora Cypress, and William Sedona. We like to keep them in our thoughts and prayers. In addition, we like to just keep in our thoughts and prayers Commissioner Davis, who's out under the weather right now. So if we can just have a moment of silence for all of those individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. And now we're moving along to um, the rest of our agenda. These are all independent items up for discussion and possible action. And so we're moving along to uh, agenda item seven, findings of fact and conclusions of law issued by the Office of the Attorney General, State of Nevada. So um, do I turn it over to you, Mr. Jordan, or to Mr. Parker? To Mr. Parker. Okay, Mr. Parker, this item. please. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is a requirement under NRS 241. We're doing what the Attorney General's office has asked us to do. And by uh, doing so, we've included the findings of fact and conclusions of law. We've put the notification in our agenda, but we've also given the, been given the right by the Attorney General to respond to it. And we've submitted our response on behalf of the agency, and we're simply waiting on a response back from the Attorney General's office. And as soon as we get that response, I'll let everyone know. Are there any questions from the commissioners for Mr. Parker? Seeing that, okay, we'll move on to this. This act. Uh, this item is not up for action. It's just for information. Right. 
So that's why we're not taking any motions on it. We'll move on to agenda item eight, modifying the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority personnel handbook to provide the executive director of our housing authority uh, the ability to modify director level employment benefits in regards to current and or future executive level employees. Mr. Jordan. Yes, there's the action is to have the board give the executive director the ability to modify the contract uh, or the uh, handbook, excuse me. This is a tool that I like to use as a means of recruiting strategy. When, you, when we're looking to bring in director level positions to the organizations, we're finding it somewhat challenging with this job market and allowing, as we look at bringing in executive level positions with uh, employees with 10 years or more, the ask is to provide them with a um, 10, 12 days of vacation upon bringing them in. And then once they're in, they will just pick up the irregular accrual process that the rest of the employees pick up. But again, we find this necessary as a recruitment strategy. Okay. Recruitment and retention strategy, I just to say. Are there any questions the commissioners of the board want to make to Mr. Jordan? Mr. Sakerbloom, do you? I just made a comment. I, I, I fully support this. Um, I know how important it is that we get top quality staff. And if you're leaving somewhere where you have a month's vacation and you're coming here and you end up with, with uh, two weeks or less, it's really tough. So I think this is well worth it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Um, just to piggyback on what Commissioner Sagerbloom just stated, uh, I do feel that we have to constantly examine mm -hmm. um, how we can attract and recruit some folks in key positions that can um, help us um, make sure that we're giving the best of our agency. So I want people to really know that we want to invest in quality so that we can really make sure that we're doing the best for all of our residents that we serve. So it's not really necessarily to benefit uh, one or two people, but it really is about the direction in which we want to take our organization and at the end of the day it's customer service for our residents that we are really striving to make leaps and bounds we're currently doing what we can but we can definitely be better than where we are so just wanted to point that out and then with the cost of living everyone's feeling it so we know that we do have to kind of analyze that factor as well so Correct. thank you so much um no other comments or questions from the board. I'm ready to entertain a motion. So I have a first from Commissioner McCurdy second. and a second from Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move along to agenda item nine, granting the executive director discretion and authority in regards to vehicle allowances and relocation costs for current and future executive level employees only. And this item is under the same vein, just keeping up with the times and looking for the, um, the latitude to examine policies like car allowances and make some uh, discretionary decisions on moving packages and things like that. Again, as we're attempting to get top quality leadership to help us navigate our processes. And so, Mr. Jordan, I, I think, um, well, I'll open it up for questions first. I do have a question in mind, but want to first defer to my colleagues. Are there any questions? Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Turner. As it states right now in your policy, what is the allowance for vehicles? It's $400 a month, if I'm not mistaken. And the relocation fees? Well, that's, again, it's, it's discretionary. Right now, um, I don't think there's a set amount but that's what we're looking to have some ability to allow me to make that decision. In fact, June is here. June, is there a set amount for relocation? Uh, no, sir. No, okay, no. So again, I, I think going back to something that, that the chair mentioned, um, historically, as I understand recruitment, you know, recruitment normally happens either moving people up or within the local jurisdiction. In order for us to attract the best talent, we need to look beyond our, our walls. And so um, the ability to go across country and, and entice talent to come here and uh, making sure that the board is aware of those kinds of decisions that the executive director has to make. 
I'm looking for policy on having that discretion. All right. Um, so I just to get the scope to um, any other questions. Sorry, I keep, <laughs> I keep wanting okay. to ask my question, but I'm like, I didn't look to this side. Do you have any questions, commissioners? Okay, um, because I think that right now a lot of people are saying, oh my goodness, what are we talking about? How many staff members are you looking to offer these um, things to? So can you kind of give us a perspective for those of us who don't? Well, it, in, it's in, in it's general, very narrow, it's not really yes. broad. So to that point, I want you to kind of say it really would only impact. Director level staff. And yeah, direct, director, deputy director, um, CFO. Just top top staff. So if if we had to put a number on it, no more than six people, seven people at the highest. Okay, because I think it's it's yes, good it's important to, to know. establish yes. that it's, right. that's how many people this decision right. would impact. And then right. also, if um, we could have a check in before you decide to move forward, Mr. Jordan, with the chair and the vice chair about what you're thinking. Absolutely. So that we can make sure that we're in the same. Absolutely. In alignment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Ms. Have, Turner has now a question. Commissioner Turner. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Craig, I'm sorry. So I sorry. have a question. So yes, based upon what you're asking, I just want to tell you what my mind thinks. My mind thinks so these mm -hmm. other people that are CFO, the HR director and deputy, or whatever the positions are, they're not receiving commensurate uh, salaries or pay or relocation. Is it lower than what's normal scale or well, something? Well, those, those individuals are here. So case in point with, with this, if we were to, with the car allowance, it would be across the board for those individuals who get a car allowance. When we're talking about things like relocation, it would be identified obviously to new employees who are coming to join the organization. It says current, all I'm asked says for, um, vehicle allowance and our relocation costs for current and our future executive level employees only. Mm -hmm. So I'm understanding that because you're asking for this increase, some of them may not have been receiving it. And because it's current and future, they're going to get it equal across the board. So as, as the chair mentioned, if we come up with a new car allowance, everyone will get the new car allowance who gets one. Um, if in, in particular, those new people who are coming in. So if the car allowance changes, it won't just be the new people get the higher car allowance, everyone will get it. With the relocation package, the, you know, as we're recruiting, we're looking to recruit people now for key positions. Those individuals, after discussing with the chair and vice chair, will we'll, uh, conclude that this is a reasonable per amount of money with receipts to move a person across the country to come here and, 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 and work with us. Does that answer your question, Commissioner? Well, not really. Because English teacher. So it says, all I'm saying is it's current and future. So I understand what you're saying about the vehicle. My question is, uh -huh. so is that increase going to be for people? This says more than vehicle. Right. So is it just going to be for just vehicle? The increase, if changed, will be for everybody, yes. Okay, that's all I need to know. Right, yes. There are no further questions. I move for approval. I have a motion to approve agenda item number nine from Commissioner McCurdy and a second from Commissioner Craig. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, we're going to move on to agenda item 10, approval to designate the maintenance mechanic classification as a critical need position. Mr. Jordan. Yes, I'm going to ask June Fleming to come and present this item. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is June Fleming. I'm the Human Resources Manager for the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority. Welcome, Ms. Fleming. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. First of all, I want to say that by designating our maintenance mechanic position as a critical need position to PERS, what is happening will the actual people that are retired we can go out to people that are retired, and if they're retired, what will happen is we can call them back in 
as a method of sourcing additional applications, applicants for their position. And their retirement will not be diminished or decreased. If you vote on it today, what will happen is we will have to forward that information over to PERS and PERS will meet on it. And that designation is also good for two years. What we're looking at is we know specifically we have had issues with recruiting that particular classification. Number one, there's a shortage. When I talked to the uh, Director of Human Resources at the PHA in Reno, he said he's having issues trying to recruit for that particular position. Other thing is we're still recruiting for it and because of uh, certain external p factors such as the great resignation where people are saying, I, I'm not coming here. Number two, they're ghosting us when we make an offer. Number three, they're asking for additional um, uh, funding or money that we may or may not have. Um, internally, we're tr you know, trying in the human resources just to try to uh, actually get out there through job fairs or other things to try to get them in. Uh, so far, we have tried um, to, with retirees, uh, there's a limitation of uh, 10, 1,039 uh, 1, hours per year that they, you know, they could work. We've actually got out there and tried to entice a couple of them, which we had to bring them back. You know, the max on PERS is 27,000. We've done almost everything that we could do. What we're trying to do is expand our potential white net sourcing net so that we can get people in. That is the basic reason why we're trying to get you all to approve the designation of the maintenance mechanic as a critical need position. Okay, thank you, Ms. Fleming. And from my understanding, we're between nine and 11 position shorts in this short in this department currently. We are, we are short. It is critical because we need these people to and how come how long in. have we been looking for we have been the replacements. We ha for context. some of them have been, you know, there are drips and drabs, but then as people latrit out, we are still having issues trying to fill those positions. It's been for months okay. and months, almost, you know, it's going closer to a year where we've had this extreme drought as try, you know, trying to get people in or whatever it is to fill the positions. Okay, I have a question from Commissioner Black. I'm just curious, June, is a maintenance mechanic dealing directly with our building infrastructure systems maintenance and repair or automotive? Building, it, building maintenance. Okay. Facilities okay. maintenance. Perfect. Thank you. That's what I thought, but I just want to be sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions, Commissioner, that I could ask, sir? He, they won't work on your Volkswagen, Scott. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Sager Bloom. Any other questions, Commissioner Turner? Um, I know there is a, um, a part where we can also look to residents, right? There could be a part where we might have a resident. We have actually uh, worked with um, uh, trying to get residents in through manpower. Okay. We've actually uh, put flyers out in the, you know, various developments. Uh, we've had a couple of people come in and actually, you know, try to do the work. Uh, but again, what we're looking at is, you know, really truly specifically a uh, skilled employee that can do the work. And we also know that nationally, when you're talking about building trades, you know, and skilled trades, there is a shortfall. And there's not enough people right now, truly, that's in the pipeline. So we're like any other entity that's in the country where we're actually trying to look for people. And that's, the, it, that's been the issue with the great resignation, COVID, and other things that have um, that have happened within the last couple of years. If there are no further questions, I move for approval. I have a first from Commissioner McCurdy and a second from Commissioner Craig. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item 11, resolution uh, number SNRHA-118, Resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority authorizing the disposition of certain public housing units located at 5000 Alta Drive, Las Vegas, Nevada. Mr. Jordan? Yes, we're going to have Frank Stafford from our modernization present this item. Good afternoon, Frank Stafford, Director of Development Modernization. 
This particular item is a resolution for the uh, James Down Tower RAD uh, project that was previously approved uh, as part of the uh, the, uh, the assembly of that that uh, of the RAD. We're doing a Section 18, which is uh, RAD RAD uh, Section 18 blend, and basically what that means is that the uh, RAD is project-based vouchers that are overlaid on the property uh, for our rents. And with the Section 18, which is a new program that HUD has came out, you're actually getting a different type of voucher that's gonna be uh, combined with those project-based vouchers. The Section 18 pays uh, slightly more, it's more like a housing, similar to the housing choice voucher uh, uh, voucher. So with this project, uh, based on the, the cost uh, to do the work compared to the housing costs, uh, I mean, the TDC for that building, we're at 90%, which means we can get 6% uh, rents based on the Section 18 uh, formula and another 40% based on the uh, project-based voucher formula. So with that being said, we are requesting uh, for the board to approve resolution number SNRHA 118 and authorize the executive director to submit, negotiate, execute, deliver, and as applicable, file any and all documents deemed necessary and appropriate to apply to HUD for disposition approval under Section 18 of the U.S. Housing Act of 1937 and attain the corresponding HUD approval in accordance therewith and in connection with the RAD Section 18 plan. Are there any questions or comments from us? Okay, Commissioner Turner. Yes, I have a question as to, are we disposing of the entire building or are we going to just modify some of it? How are we gonna use the, are we gonna use the bones? What are you really going to do once this resolution, what is going to happen? Well, the, the actual uh, resolution for this uh, disposition is converting it from the uh, public housing over to the project-based voucher. And we're just adding an additional layer on that where we're having a Section 18 project-based voucher blend. But the building will still uh, go through the same type of rehab. We'll still have the same residents living there and do the same rehab construction. There's no changes there. There are no further questions. I move for approval. <laughs> I have a sec so I have a first uh, to approve this from Commissioner McCurdy and a second from Commissioner Dismond. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Moving along to agenda item 12, approval to increase EJP Consulting Group contract number C18042 by $50,132 for application preparation for upcoming State of Nevada, Home Means Nevada, and Clark County Community Housing Fund grants and to secure a vendor to perform the environmental review required for the acquisition, rehabilitation, and RAD conversion of Hallam Homes. Mr. Stafford. Okay, this particular item is, uh, is two part. Uh, we are required to do an environmental study for the uh, Hallam Homes RAD conversion project. Typically that type of process is coordinated between the housing authority and whatever jurisdiction uh, the project is in, this case would be Clark County. Since we do not have home funds for this particular project, we are contracting with uh, EJP to, uh, to uh, have the environmental, uh, environmental study completed to expedite that process so we'll meet all of our deadlines for HUD. The second part of it is, is that we submitted uh, up to 21 home East Nevada applications uh, to the state of Nevada several months ago. And we have uh, received approval to submit as many as 20 of those uh, applications for the next phase. Not saying that we would, we would get all those approved, but we do have the, uh, the approval to do that. So we're requesting to retain EJP for assistance in getting applications approved for that process as well. And the action request is executive directors requesting the board approve an increase to EJP Consulting Group uh, for contract number C18042 in the amount of $50,132 for the combination of the preparation of multiple Home East Nevada and Clark Housing Fund applications should they be approved 
and the procurement of asbestos to conduct the environmental review needed for the acquisition, rehab, and rad conversion of Hullum Homes. Commissioner Turner? <clears throat> I'm, I'm just going to assume that this um, $50,000 will cover two things, application and the environmental study. That is correct. Okay. And during the environmental study, what do they actually do? What happens with an environmental study? Uh, well, environmental study is, is a pretty involved process, and, you know, there's a... I mean, you can give me a... Re I, I wouldn't know construction <laughs> talk, but I'm just trying to say what I'm getting for well, a month. It's, it's not so much just the construction. It's, it's basically kind of like a survey of the neighborhood that you're looking to build that project in. Okay. Mr. Stafford, can you... Okay, Commissioner Sagerbloom, did you have a question or comment? Yes, just... So do we have locations identified? And are they tied to our existing house authority, or are we looking at new properties? Uh, are this for the home of all the applications? Yes. Yes, yes we, we have identified uh, sites that include vacant, vacant properties that we have, vacant land. Uh, we've looked at uh, affordable housing developments that need work done to them. We've looked at other public housing developments that may need a total rehab or could just need some major repair work. We've also looked at our uh, manufactured home parks as well. So it's across the board. Mr. Jordan. I'd like to add to that, Commissioner, the governor set aside a little more than $500 million. We uh, have applications that we'll put in up to the tune of maybe $300 million, covering a wide variety of rehab um, and new construction with our properties, yes. Commissioner Craig. I just have a question. Uh, I wasn't able to see anything about the reputation of EJP Consulting Group. Have they been credible with us? Yes, EJP Consulting Group, they have been a, a long time partner with the Housing Authority. Uh, basically, they've consulted on all of our RAD mixed finance projects. They're currently working with us on the Choice Neighborhood Initiative uh, project that we're doing as well. Have you had many complaints, even at the best? Even if you're an archangel, there's always somebody complaining. Have the, if you, what complaints, they've been negligible? None that I'm aware of. Any further discussion or comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move for approval. I have a first uh, to approve agenda item 12. Second. And a second from Commissioner. First from Commissioner McCurdy and a second from Commissioner Black. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on to, it seems like it's the Stafford day today because yeah, he's doing all these agenda while. items. <laughs> okay, agenda item 13, right. approval to award contract C22031 to Logic LLC in the amount of $1,196,020 for elevator replacements at Harry Levy Garden, 2525 Washington Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89106, and Arthur Sartini Plaza, located at 900 South Brush Street, uh, Mr. Stafford. So this particular item is a solicitation that our procurement department put out for the elevator replacements at Arthur Sartini Plaza and Harry Levy Gardens. We received two bids for that particular uh, for that particular project, with the lowest being by Logic LLC and an amount of one million one hundred ninety-six thousand and twenty dollars. Uh, this bid has been uh, reviewed by our engineer S and B uh, Consulting and the price came back as fair and reasonable. So with that being said, we are requesting, the executive director is requesting the board of approval, board of commissioners review and approve to award contract number 22031 to Logic Inc. in the amount of $1,196,020 for the elevator replacement at Levy Gardens and Sartini Plaza at the July 21st, 2022 board meeting. I'll open it up for questions from the commissioners. Commissioner Craig. I have a question. I understand that the subcontractor is Otis Elevator, and I'm just a little, because we're spending a lot of money for an elevator replacement. Uh, 
When you pay them, you just pay them straight out. You know, if it's one million two hundred dollars, you just pay them for the construction. Or do you pay it in incrementally? For an example, maybe six months, we see how the elevators are doing. If there are any complaints, or do you just pay them straight out? Okay, this uh, the elevator project would be like our typical construction projects. Is we make periodic payments based on the amount of work that has been completed at the time of their billing. So if a project is based over a six month period, uh, the contractor will probably bill us every 30 days based on whatever equipment that has been delivered to the site and installed. And that's just how the payments, in this particular case, Otis is a subcontractor, they're not the uh, general. Thank you. Commissioner Turner? Um, does this price include um, maintenance? Um, who maintains our elevators anyway? We, we have a separate uh, maintenance contract for, uh, for the agency, and those contracts typically run. I, procurement could tell us better, but I would say probably on a three-year basis. Uh, on this project here, we will have a one-year warranty from the general contractor for the work, and then after that one year is up, then it will go over to our maintenance uh, contract. Okay, so I have another question. Have they replaced these elevators before in the past? Uh, as far as I know, the elevators at Sartini Plaza and Levy Gardens have not been replaced since the time that I've been employed here, which is close to 29 years. Okay, so uh, approximately how old are these uh, properties? About? Sartini Plaza was built, I think, in 1983 in Levy Gardens, I want to say in the early, mid-70s. Yeah, I'm like old as I am. Okay, so this might be their first replacement. So everything else, they just kind of been maintaining. Yeah, they just had the regular maintenance. So now we're like, we're just gonna get new elevators, and we'll call that done. Yes, that's one. Okay. I have a question. I'm just a little old humble woman learning about elevators. Uh, generally, I, you know, I've ridden in elevators. My question is, you say that the warranty is one year. What would that warranty cover? Uh, well, the the. The contractor's warranty for a year is for any parts or labor that they need to respond to. If there's any problems with the elevator, it breaks or whatever have you, then it's covered under the contract. One more question that I want to ask you more about elevators. Say for an example, you have an elevator that's been there, even though maybe it's been there six, say six months and residents are getting stuck on the elevator. Would that preclude you from paying that incremental payment that you give them every month? Particularly if they have that complaint, maybe somebody getting stuck on the elevator, elevator doors staying wide, would that preclude you from paying or what? Uh, typically once a, a contractor has entered the warranty phase, the job has been paid, but the only outstanding payment that we may have would be retention if that hasn't been paid at that time. But the progress payments would have already been made for the elevator, so you're looking at at least 90%. If not, the whole contract will have already been paid out. And I wanted to add, Commissioner, there's also something in our contract that says that if the vendor isn't performing properly, we have the ability to give a 30-day notice and move on to another vendor. I needed that. Thank you. I thought you would like to hear that. Yes. I have one other question. Wait, hold on. Just make sure you get acknowledged by the chair. <laughs> Just... Just for keeping the quorum and the demeanor of the meeting. So, yes, Commissioner Turner, you can have a follow-up. Um, these are where senior citizens live, correct? Yes. So how are, how are they going to be, how long will they be without this convenience? They'll work, they'll work on one elevator at a time. Uh, we don't have, of course, a schedule at this time, just based on the recent job that we did at Jamestown Towers. It took roughly about three months per elevator. So one elevator would be down during that time frame that they're working okay. on getting everything replaced. The only reason why I'm, I'm speaking is because of safety concerns and because these are elderly people. I don't know what the time frame is, but I, I think um, it, it, um, it, it will inconvenience a lot of the elderly only having one elevator at a time for you know, an extended period of time. So as soon as you know, we can get this done, the better for them. I understand. Thank you. Commissioner McCurdy. I'm so excited that these elevators are getting replaced. Um, it is it has been bad for the residents over there. I'm really particularly happy to see both of them 
uh, being replaced at both properties. So um, if there are no further questions, I'd like to enthusiastically uh, you know, make a motion to approve. <laughs> Uh, okay, Commissioner, I before have, I take your motion, I'll go to Commissioner Disman. I just have one question. Uh, because they're, they're so expensive and, and they last such a long period of time, is there a possibility with the new ones that, that uh, will replace the ones that uh, we're getting rid of to negotiate a longer warranty than a year? Well, that, that would have to be written into the contract That's what uh, I'm saying, is at, at the time that it was out for bid. If we want to do that at this particular point, then that would probably be additional cost from the contractor. And I would think that it would certainly be worth it uh, because uh, they last long and yet and still if they, any problems go with them, we're going to be very costly and it seems that it would be worth negotiating a longer warranty period. Well, just just keep in mind that on, on an item such as an elevator, the housing authority is going to have a maintenance contract in place. So once the warranty from that general contractor has expired, the warranty for the maintenance, I mean, the services for the maintenance contract will kick in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there'll, there'll be constant uh, upgrades okay. with those warranty contracts. I mean, with the maintenance contracts, I should say, they're checking on those on a regular basis and doing fine tuning or whatever you may have. That's probably why these have ran as long as they have because of the maintenance contracts. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll talk to you a little more about that another time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stafford, if I'm not mistaken, um, don't we have to be checking our elevator equipment on a regular basis per some state statute? That That is correct. The, the state of Nevada uh, has a permit on those elevators and they have to uh, inspect those annually as well. But I heard something to the tune of monthly. Sometimes they're inspecting them. Uh, not the state. I, I don't know how, to, how often the uh, inspections will occur upon the, okay. the warranty. But we there is a maintenance plan in place. Yes, there is. Okay. okay. Any other questions or comments? If not, I'll take our vice chair's enthusiastic endorsement of agenda item 13 for approval. I'll add a, st a standard second. Standard second and to go with the I don't want to be over enthusiastic. Second by <laughs> Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries, and we're so happy for those residents to finally get a new elevator that is hopefully going to be in working order for a long time. We'll move on to agenda item 14, approval to award contract C22035 to Benchmark Contracting, Inc., doing business as cobblestone construction in the amount of $36,900,000 for total rehabilitation at James Down Towers, 500 Alta Drive, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89107. And I know we've been talking as a housing authority about this property for a very long time. And so, Mr. Stafford. Okay, this, this particular item is to approve uh, benchmark con contracting DBA Carbidon's construction in the amount of $36,900 for the rehab of Jamestown Towers. Uh, procurement to cut, uh, conducted a solicitation uh, for this particular project. Uh, the uh, advertisement was out for 30 days. Uh, we only got the one bid from uh, Cobblestone Construction for this particular job. Uh, that bid has been reviewed by our architect as well as our cost estimator, and it is in line with the uh, estimate that was presented for the job. So with that being said, we are recommending approval of Benchmark Construction DBA Cobblestone construction in the amount of $36,900,000 uh, for Jamestown Towers. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Stafford, and I see Oh, that. and I, I would just like to add one, one additional item. Uh, this particular item is going to be contingent upon the approval of the HUD financing uh, that we are still in the process because we're going through the RAD, and after uh, this, uh, after the approval of the Section 18 today, we'll submit our financing plan to HUD. And at that particular point, we should have all the financing in place within, say, the next 90 days or so. So it, won't, it would be contingent upon getting all the financing approved by HUD and in place. Mr. Parker? Yes. Uh, commissioners, I wanted to uh, place on the record something that I believe is uh, important. Although the information is in the backup documentation, I thought it even more prudent to uh, inform everyone. I am counsel for Cobblestone 
I'm also counsel for a couple of their uh, subcontractors. I, I didn't review their bid as in the backup material, of course. But also, the owner of Cobblestone is my brother, my biological brother. Now, this is not, not unlike any other contract that has come before this board today. I don't know if there will be any disputes between Cobblestone and his agency. If there were disputes, of course, I would have to recuse myself as counsel for, uh, for Cobblestone if the dispute had to do with anything with this agency or his subcontractors. I've simply recused myself from it. But I wanted to make sure the board was aware of it and the abundance of caution, just in case you didn't read over it. And I also thought it was beneficial for the board to understand in, if the, a dispute ever were to arise, I would certainly uh, inform the board first, inform the executive director, recuse myself, and alternate counsel would be used to handle the defense or the prosecution of the claim on behalf of the agency. So I just wanted the board to know that. I also informed the Purchasing and Contracts Department uh, director, Mr. Shaw, of this as, as well. And so I believe he's taken the appropriate steps to uh, discuss this with HUD, because I also suggested that he uh, also discuss this with HUD Region 9 to ensure that there are no issues. Right. Thanks for sharing. Of course, of course. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Any questions for Mr. Stafford? So. Commissioner Sagerbloom. So is this the, the state uh, bonds that are federal pro that that would be the financing or just directly no. from hud no actually actually this particular uh, uh project will be funded by low-income housing tax credit four percent tax credits there are no further questions i move for approval any further okay any okay any further questions or comments before i take a motion no. Okay, seeing none, I'll take a first from uh, Commissioner McCurdy and a second from Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion, motion carries unanimously. One well, um, oh, one abstention by Commissioner Craig. Okay. My apologies, just to make the record clear. Okay. Um, that was the last order of business we had before the board today. Um, so we're going to move on along to business items under agenda item 15. So we'll receive reports from our executive director, Mr. Lewis Jordan, on any administrative and operational activities of the agency. And I do see that we have some community partners to present to us as well. So Mr. Yes. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a couple of announcements that I wanted to make. As uh, Mr. Safford mentioned, we're in the application process of the uh, Home Means Nevada project. We've submitted 21, or 21 proposals of which they've told us to prioritize the 20 applications that we'll submit. So uh, again, just to remind the, the board, this is the money that the, the governor set aside for affordable housing. Um, staff and I continue to meet with um, the Workforce Connection to look for opportunities to create training opportunities as well as we're working on the possibility of trying to develop a, a, an apprenticeship program. When you, when you look at all of the, the talk about construction and work and things of that nature that we anticipate seeing in the very near future, you know, we, we really need to make sure that our residents are positioned to take advantage of these things. So we're really excited about that. Um, um, this week we had, a, we kicked off our CNI community meetings. We had meetings at Marble Manor with our residents. And I'd just like to give a shout out to our local library who came to that meeting and provided laptops for some of the uh, residents at Marble Manor. We also last night had a community meeting and this is a community meeting with stakeholders um, in the community, particularly on the west side, to just inform them of um, where we are in the process. I wanted to bring up Kathy uh, Carton from EJP. Uh, as Frank mentioned, EJP is shepherding us through this process. And have Kathy just come up and just give some real brief highlights of the CNI process and where we're, what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, good afternoon, 
commissioners. Um, thank you for the time to speak with you. I'm Kathy Carton with EJP Consulting Group. Uh, we've been working with the Housing Authority since November when the, they were awarded the Choice Neighborhood Grant for Marble Manor and the Historic West Side. Um, we're working collectively to deliver a draft transformation plan to HUD next May um, with a final uh, transformation plan due in November of 2023. Um, so we've been working really hard with Frank Stafford and his team and um, with the city who was a co-applicant on this grant um, to kick things off. And our first phase of the planning process really uh, has been about understanding the community. So we've done a lot of work over the last couple months to pull together data um, around the demographics of residents who live at Marvel Manor in the broader historic west side understand um, the physical conditions in the neighborhood. We've mapped out transportation routes. We've looked at assets and amenities. Um, and we've also engaged in two other activities. Um, we've been conducting stakeholder interviews, had the benefit to um, talk with Commissioner McCurdy uh, in his role as part of these stakeholder interviews. We've been talking to a host of other um, folks who live, work, um, and have a stake in the historic West Side and Marble Manor. Um, but I think the biggest accomplishment to date really has been the survey that we, that we did uh, with residents of Marble Manor specifically. So the Housing Authority team and their partners at the city met individually with 80% of the residents at Marble Manor and talked with them about their needs, their wants, their aspirations for the plan, their worries about um, how things might change. And we collected a really robust um, set of data. And so we're wrapping up now our first phase, which again is that sort of understanding the community and wrapping our arms around um, who lives there now, what are the conditions in the housing in the neighborhood now, and are starting our more public facing uh, engagement. So just Tuesday night, we met with residents at Marble Manor. Um, we had the opportunity to present back to them the findings of the resident survey and sort of vet with them um, our interpretation and hear more from them um, about you know what the data means in terms of how we move forward. And then we also did a, had a similar meeting with the broader a uh, set of stakeholders in the historic West Side. Because um, as you may know, the choice neighborhood planning effort is really sort of three plans within a plan. So we're working to develop um, a plan for the redevelopment of Marble Manor itself. So we're working on a housing plan. Um, but kind of first and foremost, choice neighborhoods is a neighborhood plan. And so we're also working in tandem with the city and folks who um, are engaged in the 100 plan in action to understand how this effort intersects with the work in the broader historic west side. Um, and then we're also working to develop a people plan. How do we support residents in Marble Manor um, so that they and their families can thrive, um, that they have what they need in terms of health and wellness, in terms of uh, education and youth programming, in terms of income and employment. Um, and so I just want to point out, uh, if you have an opportunity, uh, we did produce um, a number of boards that reflect uh, principally what we heard in the resident survey, but it's coupled with some additional data that we've been able to glean from the city in terms of how the intersection with the work that we're doing in the 100 plan in action, uh, as well as um, some broader demographics to kind of, um, for comparison um, of uh, data points at Marble Manor versus the neighborhood versus the city, kind of put um, some of the responses from Marble Manor residents in context. Um, so there's information, really great information around uh, preferences for housing development. If folks have to relocate, what are they thinking now their preferences might be? Uh, we talked to them about transportation, about open space um, and recreation facilities and programming they'd like to see. We talked to them about the current income and employment status, challenges they have um, in terms of employment barriers and where they'd like to go in the future. 
Um, are their kids currently in youth programming? What kinds of programs are kids interested in? And so there's a rich array of information um, that we hope you can glean from the boards we produced here and data that Frank and his team will continually be updating on our project website. So thank you for the time. Well, thank you for sharing all of that information. I do know that a couple commissioners may have questions or comments, so I'll start with Commissioner McCurdy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first question I have is, number one, thank you for your work. Um, mm -hmm. Before I go into my questions, I want to say thank you, because I know uh, it's often not easy when you're engaging in these types of conversations, but uh, particularly excited for what's to come if we do it right. Of what percentage of the total number of folks who live in Marble Manor participated in the surveys? 80% of residents participated in the surveys. And I have to give a shout out to the Housing Authority team and their city partners. We were really pleased to see the response and the speed with which they managed to connect with so many households. That is often a big hurdle in these planning processes and we've done it around the country and it, it worked exceptionally well here in Las Vegas. So we're really pleased with the participation. Yeah, I wanna start there because uh -huh. I think that speaks to just the level of engagement that we've had and the level of engagement that the community members are going to continue to, to show as you know they look to try to take ownership of their own lives again. Mm -hmm. um, so what was one of the, the largest takeaways that you had as a part of the surveys that went out? Like for instance, for mm -hmm. me, you know, it was very, you know, concerning, but also, um, you know, it helped me to understand just how much work there is to do. Like, for instance, the median household income at Marble Manor is ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in the historic West Side, it's twenty-four thousand dollars. Versus in the city of Las Vegas, mm -hmm. uh, it's nearly sixty thousand uh, dollars. That lets us know that we obviously have a lot of work to do in, in terms of education, but also in terms of economic development and activity. Uh, mm -hmm. But for you, from your position professional position, um, what do you think uh, is one of the, the, the biggest highlights or, or biggest obstacles or biggest opportunities mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to these conversations? Oh, it's so hard to say there's because there's so much rich data there. And it and the thing about choice neighborhoods is so comp comprehensive. Um, so the intent is to address a whole array of topics and challenges in the neighborhood. For me personally, um, one of the things that jumped out is the how low the median age at the property is, how many families with children and how many um, children live at the site. Um, it's a much higher proportion than we've seen in a lot of the other communities that we've worked. And so I think being very deliberate about how um, we plan for families with children and what opportunities there are for young people is really important. Okay. Another thing that jumped out was, um, and I encourage everyone to take a look at some of the boards over there, uh, is the relocation preference. You know, uh, I thought that that was pretty interesting as well. Uh, but just again, just more of a comment. Just thank you for the work and I'm looking forward to continue to learn more as you dig into the community. Well, it's uh, Commissioner Turner. I'm sorry. When I see, please forgive me. Um, I just want to speak to the director for a moment. On our website, are there any links that residents or anyone can get information from? I think that would be a good thing to add um, because I think that would be the highlight of what we're experiencing, new growth and development. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, our website should reflect some of those positive things that are going on within our housing authority. So the short answer is yes, and Kathy can speak to that. Yeah, so there has been a project website developed. Mm -hmm. uh, up to this point, a lot of the work has been um, has not been public facing. So now we're in a position to really share the results of the survey. Um, we have developed a really nice brochure that we handed to, shared with residents at the public meeting that can go on the website. We have much more detailed um, table that shows exactly how people responded to every single question that we're intending to put on the website. We've developed a PowerPoint um, for our presentation. So there'll be a lot more material going forward that we can share with the public and we'll make sure it gets added to that website. Mm -hmm. Any further questions or comments from the board? Sounds like you've done a lot of really amazing work. 80% uh, reach is 
not something to be, hang and your that, head yeah. over. And so that's the housing authority and city team. That yes. was not us. So I'm <laughs> proud of, of that feat. That's that's remarkable. So look forward to hearing. Um, let's see. Commissioner Turner has a follow up. One more comment. Um, because I do have so many council members for the city to, um, you know, I, I just want to make sure and, and make it very clear that the residents should be able to really benefit from all the development that's going to take place. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be regentrification, mm -hmm. other people coming in, sucking up a community mm -hmm. in which many of us have been raised, mm -hmm. personally, me, myself. I just want to make sure and make it very clear that these residents have gone through so many things already in their life and to come back and not be able to afford the community that they're going to redevelop. They should be able to buy homes and be able to really work with the, uh, these amenities. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to cost to bring them there. So we know it's going to cost for them to produce their products and services. We want to make sure our residents of just not Marble Manor, but our community and our neighborhood really are able to enjoy what we are building mm -hmm. together. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Turner. We have um, Mr. Jordan. Yes, so to Commissioner Turner's point, you're absolutely right. And this, this process will have a one-for-one -one replacement. Every public housing unit that's there will be replaced with the public housing unit. Um, and also what we're looking to do as we develop a plan and a strategy, we're, we're looking to do the rehab and building in phases so that, you know, and, and in those phases, it would be ideal to have a build first strategy. So that would eliminate the probability of people moving out of the community. But you're absolutely right. In addition to in the process, we'll create opportunities for jobs and job trainings and things of that nature. That's why it's so critical that everyone over the next 18 months are really, really involved in what is good for the community. Historically, HUD comes in and says, this is what we think is good for your community to do it. This is one of those times where it's being put back on us to decide what's best. And as indicated, we've really gotten off to a good start in this process. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Um, I have a comment. Well, we'll start with Commissioner Craig and then we'll go to Commissioner McCurdy for his comment. I just want to say I'm impressed and I'm jealous. Um, I like those numbers. I know those are very rare numbers, statistically very, very rare. So I, I thank you. Mm -hmm. And I thank the individuals who live at Marvin Manor mm -hmm. in the community for doing an excellent job because they get negativity and I'm just mm -hmm. thrilled. I can't jump off here because well, you know what would happen if I jumped off here. My knees would mess up. I just want to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner McCurdy? Yeah, and also uh, just, just pointing out that uh, we had an opportunity to, to begin a conversation with uh, Workforce Connections about how we can, you know, create that partnership to get our residents uh, the skills and training that they need to possibly, you know, engage in some of these opportunities. So I thank you for lifting that up and just want to let you know that we are also having other conversations to get our residents prepared. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Jordan, what else do you have for us? Thank you. Before I bring up our community partners, I wanted to uh, make mention, you know, we've talked about project-based vouchers and uh, in our last few meetings, we've indicated that we're waiting for HUD to approve the RFP to put project-based vouchers on the, um, on the street in a competitive process. But today we're thrilled to announce that we can offer some project vouchers on a non-competitive basis for developers that have received any type of home or low income tax credit funds that uh, were subject to a competition in accordance with requirements of the application program, community development program or supportive services program that requires competitive um, selection of proposals. So in other words, if a developer has gone through these hot competitive programs in the last three years, they don't have to go through another competitive process of which we're waiting for HUD to approve us 
on the, um, the project-based vouchers we've spoken of. So with that being said, um, we're uh, in May of 2020, Nevada Hand, Nevada Hand uh, was awarded $1.7 million in home funds through a competitive process. And it's with much excitement that we're today able to offer Nevada Hand 25 project-based vouchers for the Decatur Common Senior Complex. And you know, we've talked a lot today about James Down Tower. Well, Decatur Commons is right next door. And these 25 project-based vouchers that we'll award to them today can be a part of our relocation strategy for the tenants who uh, are living in James Down. Tim Veenstra was here. I know he said he had to sneak out uh, from, uh, from Nevada Hand. But again, we're still awaiting HUD to approve the overall 200 plus that we wanted to put out for a competitive process. But today we can award 25 to, um, to Nevada Hand, and I'm excited to do that, so. Right, can I just ask, so are those new vouchers? These are, these are what, what the project-based voucher rule allows us to do is take 20% of our existing vouchers and project-based. So they come from our, from our overall total, but it allows us to put people in housing much quicker than say had they been just waiting on a wait list. And then can the developer use those as part of their financing to say yes. they... Okay. I'm sorry to cut you off of question. Yes. It's a, it's a very good opportunity. More importantly, it, you know, we have um, tenants at James Down who literally would just move across the street and stay in the community. And uh, so we, we see it as a win-win. Commissioner Craig? I just want to say they have some great things, accoutrements over next door that senior citizens would enjoy, as well as younger people. So I'm really excited about that process. Thank you. See any further questions on that? All right, thank you. So I'd like to now, um, as, as you all recall, over the last few months, with the intent of showing that housing is much more than just bricks and mortar. You know, providing quality housing has a lot to do with the services and the opportunities that are created for those we serve. And we have here today um, representative from the Culinary Academy and also from uh, the University of NLV TRIO program. So if Yasima can come on up and introduce yourself and Tell us all a little bit about the great work you all are doing at the Culinary Academy. Okay, very good. Thank good you. afternoon. Welcome, Yesenia Trujillo from the Culinary Academy. She's not uh, an unknown partner to <laughs> some of us that are sitting up here. We know that through the pandemic, Culinary Academy did a lot of um, work with us in getting, um, making sure that everyone didn't go hun hungry, uh, that we're, we're food secure. And so we appreciate everything you guys did to do a lot of the pop-up events with um, drive-through uh, food uh, for folks to not go hungry or as the paychecks were uh, smaller, obviously we have to make some hard decisions. So thank you so much for that partnership. Good afternoon to everyone, like Miss um, Olivia Diaz. Uh, already introduced me. Thank you for that great introduction. As you know, well, my heart still goes to the community and I have to change my hat now to go back to the Culinary Academy of Las Vegas. That, as you know, we are offering 12 different trainings that we are have funding uh, to pay and help our community to go through these trainings. And I'm meaning pay for the trainings. It's not only tuition, we also have uh, childcare, we have transportation. We try to help our students with any type of barrier they can present to come to the, uh, the academy. Uh, but what is our challenge right now? Uh, it's hard to recruit, it's hard to people come out and continue learning. I always tell them pandemic taught us something. We need to be in our A game. If this stop, we have another skill to go for it. So I always tell the students, come on, um, take a training. We will help you. I always say, I cannot guarantee you a job placement. I can guarantee you skills. I can guarantee you that you will have an interview with our partners. We have 36 partners on the strip that they give them uh, 
priority to be higher on the strip. Uh, we have Jaffers on campus. We attend uh, MGM, Caesar Palace, Win Jaffers. We present our students directly to them and they will come and say, uh, send me the list of the students you are graduating already. They come to our graduation. Matter of fact, the graduation was about to start right now. We are graduating 98 students. Um, that it looks a lot of students, but honestly, it's kind of low number of students. We are used to graduate since I started there that 10 years ago, uh, 150 minimum to 200 students per month. Uh, graduation is every third Thursday of the month. Everyone is welcome to come and you will see what we offer to our students. Uh, some of our students didn't get um, some high school uh, prom that they call them or graduation. So we make a special. They have the gown and cap. We offer Mac um, bar, Mac uh, restaurant. So they have that uh, experience. They come with their family. They have uh, pictures, um, frames, so they can do all this for them. Uh, this 12 classifications is everything from housekeeping, food and beverage, and uh, we have the wine server and sommelier classes. They are like one of our highest classes there. Uh, if anyone can come and attend our information session on Wednesdays at 10 a.m., free to everyone, they just have to be there before 10 a.m. I brought some brochures. I can leave them um, our, with the agency. If anyone, I can go and do presentations to one. Uh, uh, I hear about our the communities you have that I attend your like all the communities you were mentioning with food services, with uh, food delivery. So I know the need of these communities. I know the need of these complexes. If they need me, we can go directly to them to do presentations to help them in the process of registration. Also, we have computer classes and. English classes for free. The English classes are totally uh, for free. ESL and visa classes. Any questions? <laughs> Commissioner Craig. I'm for education 100%. So I wanted to thank you for that great uh, presentation and giving us hope and making us look good. And thank you, Ms. Diaz. Thank you. Any further comments or questions for Ms. Trujillo? Yeah. Um, Commissioner McCurdy. Yeah, I just wanted to also um, just thank you for your work. Uh, I just had an opportunity to recently um, meet with um, Mr. Juan Edmund, and uh, it looks like there there may be an opportunity, a lot of opportunity, uh, to to make sure that our community is is well aware of all the opportunities to have available to them through you. Uh, so we definitely need to make sure that we are um, connecting with. Um, Martha and we are connecting our residents with you know this opportunity. It's about seven weeks, right? Most most of the the, the different between offerings. three weeks to six months, depending which class are they taking. Yeah, so uh, these are you know incredible jobs, you know, and um, I'm looking forward to to the ongoing partnership. Clark County, you know, enjoys working with you, and again, just want to say thank you. Okay, Commissioner Turner. Yes, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what you have for youth. Do you guys do anything with youth or certain age groups? 18 and up, and uh, they are working right now with the post-secondary education to lower to 17 years old. I always tell during my um, report to my executive team, we need to expose this youth. We need, they are lost. If you don't put their hands on, they will not know what to do. So that's why we are working now to lower the um, age to 17 years old and move forward. Uh, other than that, that we offer the paid internship and externship. The internship, it can be done at the academy or the government center or the Smith Center. And they can work up to 300 hours in each location. They continue learning. Mr. Jordan. I, I see some tremendous opportunities here. As you know, Commissioner Desmond and I have been talking about pre-apprenticeship programs, uh, you know, opportunities around housekeeping, how opportunities around helping to uh, prep our units for uh, as one family move out. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot, lot of um, creative things we can talk about 
to partner with this partner even more. So thank you. All right, Commissioner Sagerblum. Just, um, I don't know what the city does for food, but, but uh, <laughs> they make our food at the county and they do a fantastic job. So I'm not, you probably don't have a cafeteria here, but anyway, thank you so much for all you did with us during the pandemic and for my lunches every day. All right, I think we're good. Thank you so much, Ms. Trujillo. Thank you. Good for, to see you and keep you. up the great work. Thank you for having us at uh, the culinary. I'm glad to represent the Academy. Excuse me. Thank you. And good luck with the graduation today. Thank you. Yeah. And Madam Chair, as noted, UNLV is in the house, so we like to have the representative come up and speak to who they are and what they're doing. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, board. My name is Jeff Dietrich. I'm the assistant director for the Education Opportunity Center at UNLV. We fall under the Department of Education. So with the board's permission, or actually with the chair's permission, if I could approach, I have some handouts for the commissioners to read through while I give my quick read. So if anybody's familiar with TRIO, I'll give you a quick history on that. Is anybody familiar with the TRIO programs? The majority of them you're going to find in the high schools or middle schools, upward bound, education, talent, search, et cetera. There's two adult education programs, and one of them is the Education Opportunity Center that we oversee here at UNLV. The intent of this program is to assist adults getting into a post-secondary education, regardless of that's university or vocational tech program. One of the services we offer is we offer high school equivalency practice testing. Our test is four hours long. We work closely with the Clark County Adult Education System, or excuse me, Clark County Adult Education Program. So they come in and take our practice test. They pass it. We provide them with a $75 voucher that pays for real tests at the Clark County School District Adult Ed. When they pass that, they come back around and talk to us about getting them into school because that's the main objective of our program. So if somebody wants to come in and be a truck driver, cool. We'll look for truck driving programs and help them out. If they want to go to university and be a mechanical engineer, cool. We'll help them with that as well. So our assistance includes admissions process, financial aid, basic scholarship research. And then a lot of times people are on the fence about what they want to do. So we help them kind of run down the programs available in the Valley that they're interested in. We don't offer any monetary uh, assistance. That's why we do with the federal, the free application for federal student aid and basic scholarship research. We're a small federal program, so we just don't have the resources to be provide monies um, to help people pay for school. But again, that's why we get into the scholarship research with the students and or participants and help them complete the free application for federal student aid. If you're unaware of what the FAFSA is, that's where you apply for to get federal student loans and or Pell Grant money. Pell Grant money being free money from the government to help you offset the cost of tuition at whatever school you decide to go to, be it vocational or a university. When it comes to the high school equivalency practice test, because we're a small program, we do not offer any type of classes. The intent of our practice test is to see where the individual is at so they know what they need to work on. And then we refer them over to the Clark County Adult Education Program because they have teachers on staff, they have assistance they can get and need to really get into what they need to do as far as that's concerned. The only learning thing that we offer really is one of our academic coordinators, George, who was supposed to be here, but uh, changed his schedule, I came is he does free math tutoring because that's about 98 percent of the people's challenge when they come in and take their high school equivalency practice test is the math our practice test mirrors the real test so the state of nevada recognizes the high school equivalency test as the official test everybody says ged ged's been being said since like 1974 a company now owns it copyrights the name so when you hear ged it's just an overall general term the state of nevada recognizes the high school equivalency test so when somebody comes take our practice test, it's a snapshot of what the material they're gonna see on a real test, so there's no tricks. It's just gonna be presented to them differently um, as far as the material is concerned. And then if they're interested, the main objective of our program is to come back around so we can look at a post-secondary education that they're interested in, truck driving, electrician, teacher, engineer, whatever it is, we help them with the process of actually getting into the school. Now, if they so decide to go to UNLV, there's some trio programs for college students because we're considered a pre-college program, but there's some uh, programs on campus that they can get enrolled at that assist the college students while they're going to university. Um, our program came out of Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty in 64, then in 1965, you had the Secondary Education Act, 
and that's where the TRIO program started. So with these two EOC programs we manage here, we have to see 1,000 people per program. So we have to see 2,000 people per year to render services. Two-thirds of those individuals must fall into the low-income and first-generation bracket. So about 670 individuals, 1,500 in total for the year for these two programs have to be first-gen or low-income based off of the program that was written when the Education Opportunity Center, I think, was uh, established in 1977. So that's what we do here. All of our services are free. No one pays a dime because it's a taxpayer-funded program. They fill out an application that's three pages, demographic information, and the third page is the need information. And the needs page lets us know what we need to assist that individual with if they're looking to achieve their education, high school equivalency, or they're looking to go into school. Um, in all transparency, because we're federal, the individual must be a citizen or have an A number um, because we're a federal program, so we have to go by those rules and regulations out of the Department of Education. Saturday, we were here testing. George and my other colleague, Terrell, tested 15 individuals here in the chamber um, that we had set up, which is, we really thank you for that because we've been kind of hurting on our testing numbers this year. I don't know if it's an inflation issue, economic issue, I think is the problem. People are trying to get jobs and stuff, and so, We've seen a pretty big decline in our high school practice testing since COVID started. So honestly, this year, having 15 people we're excited about because that's the most we've tested in one place at one time this year because most, they're scheduling, but they're not showing for whatever reason. So we're kind of one of those programs we can lead you to water, but we can't make you drink it type of deal. But we're here to assist as much as we can with the education piece. Do I have any questions from the commissioners? Any questions? Um, I do have a question if no one has, and then, or maybe I'll take after. So, um, did I catch the date correctly? You've been doing these services since? So, the EOC program at UNLV has been here for going on 20 years. The okay. EOC program nationally was like 1977 was we were created in the Department of Education. Okay, because when I was a youth, which was not too long ago here in the valley. <laughs> These services didn't exist locally, so that's why I kind of wanted to understand because I'm a first gen. I'm yes, low, you know, come from working class, so um, that's why I asked. Uh, how do you determine what institutions you're offering the programming out of? What does it take? for a high school to receive the supportive services so, at their campus? Like, so with this one, we're adult ed, so it's 19 and above. So what it is, is when you look around the country and you see a TRIO program, regardless if it's Upper Bound or ETS or us, they have to do a write-up, do economic research on the area they're doing a write-up for to justify, yes, we can have this program here because of the need, because of the low income and first generation after they do the research. And so all of them, you're either going to find it a university, you're going to find it a community college, or you're going to find it a nonprofit. So long story short, it's soft money, it's grant money, so it's got to be written for to pull it into the community. Now with Upper Bound and ETS, when they go to write for those grants, they have to go to the schools that they find. So like our Upper, I think we have Upper Bound, Math Science, and Upper Bound, like it. So Cheyenne, for example. Um, they have to go and engage with the principals there and get permission from the principal to say, yes, we need this program in this school. So they can put that into the grant and then send it up to the Department of Ed so it can be evaluated. So they just can't say, yeah, I'm going to go to Cheyenne and just show up one day and not have permission from the principal to Clark County School District. So, you know, you have to work closely, especially with us, the center here at UNLV, we manage t well, roughly 25 Department of Education grants. We manage more grants than any other place in the country. The center here at UNLV, and it's been in place since 1977. Uh, Dr. William Sullivan started, um, if anybody's familiar with Dr. Sullivan. So, um, so we have a ton of grants, but you do have to engage, especially if they're going to go into the high schools and middle schools, you have to engage with the principals there to get permission, because sometimes, uh, with my colleagues, sometimes they don't want them in that, that school. Uh, where you're not going to find these type of programs, you're not going to find them in the high schools in Summerlin, you're not going to find them in the high schools in Green Valley. They're going to be like when you read the grants, they're specifically written for those high, in, uh, high areas that have low income and first generation students. Good, um, because that's mostly my, my um, ward and we have a ways to go still on making sure that we advance our youth on different pathways. It yes, doesn't necessarily mean college bound, but are they career and technical trade yes. ready? And some of these trades do require a very good 
foundation in order for them to have access to these pathways, exactly. right? Exactly. So um, my schools are in complete need. So yeah. I, I would rather we focus where the need is the greatest first yeah. before we spread to the other areas. So um, I don't want to monopolize the time. Uh, Commissioner Craig. I yes, believe in education, I repeat again, but what about the programs for the offenders or ex-offenders? Um, have a thing about felonies. Oh, whatever. no, ma'am, we work with them. So before COVID started, if anybody at the Clark County Detention Center, there's a program called the CARES event that they hold monthly. And so what they do at the Clark County Detention Center is they bring in outside community partners to speak to the inmates and have them come through and talk to those people to provide them with services. So when they're released, they have some services to fall back on to get some support. We're the education piece. We've been working with Clark County Detention Center. I think they started that program in 2018. So we've been with them for four years. Um, and that's a monthly thing. Of course, COVID hit, we weren't going out there. So as a matter of fact, uh, my colleagues, Rayshawn and Terrell were there. Um, July 6th was the last one. They have one. The next one is 20 August at the North Complex out at uh, Nellis. So, and we've also been out to working with Casa Grande and PMP. So we're in that section too, um, going out to speak to the individuals that are incarcerated so we can provide some kind of education services and support when they come out. Any further questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation and for the partnership with our housing authority to meet the needs of our clients. We're really appreciative. Well, thank you, Commissioner Diaz. Appreciate it. I have some folders here I'll leave out with the agenda items that we had. So anybody in the commission um, and or the public can pick up. It has our flyers in it with different resources and numbers. So if anybody's interested, I'll leave it out there. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Thank you. Commissioner Madam Chair, we'll, we'll continue to find ways to partner with, you know, good partners like UNLV to make sure that we can make sure that our resident base, and as mentioned earlier, particularly our youth, are um, exposed to these opportunities. And Madam Chair, that concludes the Executive Director report. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. We're gonna go ahead and go right to our second public comment period. This is uh, the second comment period by our general public. Items raised under this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated or acted upon by the Board of Commissioners for the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority until the notice provisions of the open meeting law have been complied with. If you wish to speak on matters not listed on the posted agenda, please step up to the podium, clearly state your name and address, and please spell your last name for the record. And uh, the amount of time any single speaker is allowed will be limited to three minutes. Just want to remind everyone that all comments by the speakers should be relevant to our role as Board of Commissioners of this Housing Authority. Hi, my name is Ayana Shaw, and my last name is spelled S-H-A-W. You need my address? Yes, please. My address is 1437 Blushing Bright Street, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89110, and I am a resident of Scattered Sites. And I am here because um, I wanted to speak to the board about my current situation as a resident. Um, I had an incident on June 15 where I fell and dislocated my knee. And I made it very, um, I went to the, to the housing and turned in my paperwork showing that I wasn't working because of my current condition. And they are currently trying to evict me because I cannot afford to pay my rent right now. Um, so that's why I'm here, because I wanted to bring this to you guys' attention. And I just now was able to speak to Miss Eva this morning. And she said she's going to take care of it, but I still wanted to bring it to you guys' attention. But I also wanted to comment um, about you guys hiring for the uh, residents to work for Housing Authority. They hired me in, in 2015 for Clark and then fired me six months later and did not give me a valid reason why. So that was kind of a setback for me, especially when y'all say you want us to um, go out and be successful and all these other things, and then you turn around and fire me, and I'm a single mother of two children. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Anyone else wishing to offer public comment at this time? 
Good morning, Kanisha Kelly, landlord to 3788 Nareen Passway. So as I mentioned earlier, my tenant is experience some, uh, experiencing her casework and being very abrupt with her and her financial changes. She has had a reduction of child support and her caseworker told her that her um, that they can't calculate it right now, but her rent is going to increase seven hundred and fifty dollars uh, in August, and she was just notified late June. She's also a bus driver with CCSD, so of course she's off in the summer months. She has three teenage daughters, so it is definitely my concern because she is renting my unit to uh, support the need that her financials uh, are going to to greatly change and she's getting a great reduction in her child support. It went from two, I think 250 to now $91 for three teenage daughters. So I need to just have her um, case reevaluated so the her financials can balance back out. Um, she also just had her car be possessed. So um, I loaned her $1,000 to make sure she got her car because she, she doesn't have transportation to get to where she needs to go. That's going to, again, greatly affect herself, her family, and myself. So um, I just would like to know who I can speak with to have her um, case reevaluated as soon as possible before the next rent is due. Mr. Jordan? We'll have staff meet with you immediately after this meeting. Okay. I, I, thank, I thank you. And I also have had my own encounters with the staff being very abrupt when we had a, um, what is it called, excuse me, inspection due. And the inspection, my tenant took off of work to have, you know, be, be there for the inspection. And they called her that morning to say, hey, we're not coming. So it was already, she needed to wait between 9 and 12. So they called her maybe at like 9.30 and told her that they weren't coming. So she missed a day of work waiting for somebody to tell her that it's not enough staff. So when I called in to say, hey, what's going on? Can't you guys just pass it through like you did with COVID? She said, no, ma'am, you know, we're working and we're doing the best we can. We have short staff, but I'm sure we hopefully knew that the staff was going to be short the day before or, or, or whatever. So that's another thing to address with the staff to have more better customer service across the board. And if you can restate your name, I didn't quite catch That's okay. It. Venetia, V-I-N-I-S-H-A, Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Diaz. Appreciate and thank you. Thank you, board. Next person for public comment. Beatrice Turner. Um, I got a, had got a call from my landlord, and he said to me, he said, did you get a letter saying they was um, cutting your rent? And I said, no. He said, well, they didn't send me the full amount. So I called the housing authority, and then I get a letter. No, I called the housing authority, and the caseworker called me back. She wasn't too happy about calling me back. But I want to go on record. This day and say, I've been in this battle over 30 years, and I ain't, I don't talk to them no any kind of way, and I'm not going to let them talk to me no any kind of way. I don't know who told her to call me, and she called me with that attitude that she had. She can save that attitude because she didn't even have to call me with that because I made sure my landlord went to the bank and found out what happened. Because they had another tenant who had vacated, and the housing authority had paid her them more than they should, instead of them sending a letter to my landlord saying we're gonna t we this need to be paid back, they just went and took it out the account where my rent money go to, and didn't even send my landlord no letter, no nothing saying we overpaid you, no nothing. Didn't send them anything. And I don't, you know, they should send the people stuff. Because, see, this is my Libya caregiver right here. And I had her to rent her house out so she could come and help take care of me. But um, the way you talk about customer service, they need some damn customer service down here real bad. Because they 
try to talk to people like that mad you got sitting up there at the city. They try to talk to people like she do. And you know, Medea, don't take that, because I don't play with your mouth, so you know I ain't going to take it from them. And I wasn't being disrespectful to her when she called, but she had a very, very nasty attitude. And the last thing I got to say, I was born and raised here. I got invested interest in West Las Vegas. My mama's home sit there. And my son is disabled and living in it. And it's right across the street from Marble Manor. So whatever happens to Marble Manor, it affects my mother's home. And believe me, because he not going to say nothing. I'm going to have to be the one step to the plate and say something. Because she wanted to put the house in my name. And because I was fighting with the housing authority so much at that time, she said, no, nah, because they might take my house from, from me trying to sue trying to sue you so i said put it in my son's name and that's what she did but he lives right across from marble manor and whatever happens in marble manor it affects the people that live across the street and baby they've been there 20 and 30 years across that street and you mr scott i want my damn agenda that i was supposed to get how long ago Phyllis Carpenter, 5200, or 5200 Alpine Place. This is a butter tray that it was in my kitchen. See the mold in it? I have never seen mold grow like that. This is two and a half, three weeks old. I, my, my son dated it for me. Um, there's something growing in my apartment for sure. My niece came um, in June, or excuse me, in, yeah, in June, she needed, she needed to come stay for a week. So her and the kids was in, in, in the process of transitioning to another apartment. Her apartment wasn't ready, so she came and stayed with me for the week. Um, she has a three-month-old baby and a 12-year-old. The three-month-old baby, within three days, spiked 103 fever. Um, she took him to the emergency room, couldn't find anything wrong. Um, came back, and then the next day, the baby started, it's, he sounded like he had croup, kind of. Um, he was wheezing. Then she got a respiratory infection. I got a respiratory infection. Um, the 12 year old got a respiratory infection. Their, um, alt their, their remedy to it was to bring me because I had turned on the air when she came. It wasn't hot yet. So I wasn't really using the air. Um, when she came, I turned the air on because of the baby. And, um, that's when we all got sick. So she left, they brought me two portable air conditioners. And that was their remedy to it. They said they was going to have the ducks cleaned. Nothing's been done. Um, the resident council, um, our resident council, the treasurer resigned. There was only three of us because the president had resigned the month before or whatever. Um, and she's, the, the treasurer insisted that we had a quorum of three that we could, we could, you know, still run. But honestly, they had switched the bylaws so that the president ran a term of two years. So when the president resigned, I feel like the housing authority should have helped us keep at least the president in long enough to appoint somebody else so that we wouldn't have to be without a board for two years. Because at the point we're at right now, we can't, you, there's not an election for the president until next year because Kathleen Bell never finished out her term from last year. And they want the keys back for me. I'm, I'm the second vice. I run the kitchen, um, they, so if there's any activities going on in the in the community room, I I provide the drinks, whatever I do, whatever need be, to 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 you know to assist them, um, and they want my keys back now. I feel like my position isn't up until March. I shouldn't have to give my keys back until March. Um, I don't know what else to say. Um, there's a leak that is in the middle of the property. I showed Ava two months ago when she was there, still there. And it's a big leak. Um, I don't know what else to say. Uh, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Mr. Jordan, can you make sure that appropriate? Yes, Madam Chair, we'll give immediate attention to these issues. Thank you. I admit she come here every month with the issues about out there where she lived at. 
and ain't nothing been did yet. We'll make sure we get a follow up on it, correct, Mr. Jordan? That is correct, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Any further public comment at this time? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned.